Hello everybody, now today we're going to have a look at another poem from the Poems of the Decade anthology for Edexcel English Literature A-Level, and we're going to have a look at the fantastic poem A Minor Role by UA Fanthorpe. Now, in a very similar way to On Her Blindness, this is another poem that looks at how we put on pretenses, how we act in the face of illness, and really at the heart of this poem there is a tension between truth and and evasion, evading the truth. Um, so just to look at this summary to begin with, it says the speaker of the poem is seriously ill. Now I will return to that actually because that's just one interpretation, there is another interpretation of this. Um, but she admits that being ill requires her to play a role in order to maintain the illusion that everything is okay. Fanthorpe also outlines the mundane realities of illness, hospital waiting rooms, listening to consultants, taking medicine, pretending to others that she's getting on and getting better. The poet lists what she does when she's at home, such as finding happy novels to read, tidying up and answering the phone, and at the end of the poem, the speaker affirms the value of life. So it's true, at the end of this poem, there it does end a little bit more positively than some of the other poems in, in this collection that also deal with the idea of loss and death. Now, uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, seen this very famous Shakespeare quote from As You Like It. All the world's a stage and all the men and women are merely players. Now, this metaphor, this idea of putting on an act and the world being a stage, I want you to keep that in your mind as we as we look at this poem, because it's really central to, to what this poem is really about. At the start of this poem, the conceit of acting is introduced. And these are two terms that I really need you to... Um, be aware of when we explore this poem in, in further detail. So a conceit is, is basically a, a large extended metaphor, and there is an extended metaphor of acting that runs through this poem. Uh, you can probably tell that by the poem's title, A Minor Role. Um, and, as I mentioned earlier, this poem also looks at pretense, the idea of making something appear better than it is. Uh, as it says here in the definition, an attempt to make something that is not the case appear true. In this case, that the, that the person who's ill is feeling well. Um, so pretense and the idea of putting on an act and a, uh, the, a literary conceit, as in an extended metaphor, is really, uh, really two important terms that you need to know uh, before we explore this poem in detail. So moving on to the poem itself. I'm best observed on stage, propping a spear or making endless exits and entrances with my servant's patter. Yes, sir, and oh no, sir, if I get these midget moments wrong, the monstrous fabric shrinks to unwanted sniggers. So we can see here the title itself suggests the idea of performance and putting on an act, and the conceit of acting is introduced very, very early. Um, the, the speaker of the poem says that they're best just being observed, P propping a spear or making <laughs> exits and entrances uh, quite regularly, just like a character, a minor character, would in a, in a show. In this example, uh, the speaker com compares themselves to a servant, someone who just comes in and, and has minimal dialogue and has just usual patter, as she, as she says. If I get these midget moments wrong, the monstrous fabric shrinks to unwanted sniggers. Now, here we see this idea of fabrication being introduced, this idea of putting on, a, on an act. Um, is this a wider metaphor for life, that life is somewhat of a monstrous fabric, that we have to, you know, we have to do minor levels of acting every day to make ourselves appear a certain way, to make ourselves... Um, appear in a better position than we perhaps are in reality. Now, I mentioned at the start in the in the summary that that that, that said that the speaker of this poem is ill. Now, I, I probably ought to address that pretty early. There's there is plenty of evidence that the speaker of this poem is the person who's got the illness. But there is also an interpretation that the speaker of the poem is actually the partner of someone who's ill. And actually, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards that view. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more in a second. 
but my heart's in the unobtrusive, the waiting room roles, driving to hospitals, parking at hospitals, holding hands under veteran magazines, making sense of consultants' monologues. A consultant is a very high up doctor, a surgeon. Uh, where am I? Uh, asking pointed questions politely, that's very British. Checking dosages, dates, getting on terms with the receptionist, sustaining the background music of civility. Now here uh, we see quite a lot of asyndetic listing of, 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 of present participle verbs to signify a kind of constant activity. And this conceit of acting is continued. Um, the speaker says that, that they're usually found in waiting room roles, as if that's a role that they have to play as well in conversing with uh, uh, the consultants who are monologuing and speaking probably a lot of scientific jargon that doesn't make sense uh, to, a, to an average person. Uh, they mention about uh, getting on terms with the receptionist, which signifies just how often they are having to, to visit the hospital. And it mentions at the end of this stanza, sustaining the background music of civility. Again, I think this is very similar to keeping the monstrous fabric of things intact, maintaining the background music of civility, making sure that... that um, that you are not left um, in a vulnerable position, that you are making sure that things at least appear to be civil and appear to be uh, to be fine. So what we see here is Fanthorpe really listing the mundane realities of illness, the, the things that are often not thought about uh, when, when we think of illness. Um, but despite this illness, it does seem that there is very little time for reflection um, there is this, as I said, through the asyndetic listing, this this constant activity. And I will leave you to question whether this is just uh, a sign of how much there is to do when you're when you're ill, particularly if you've got a kind of long illness, or is this is this speaker just simply keeping herself busy and perhaps gaining a form of consolation from these routines and keeping busy and keeping active. At home in the street, you may see me walking fast in case anyone stops. Oh, getting on, getting better, my formula for well-meant intrusiveness. What a brilliant line. Um, now, the idea of pretense here is developed. Um, the speaker says that she has a formula for uh, people who are being <laughs> who are well-meaning yet also intrusive presumably these are friends uh, or family inquiring about the illness and she simply responds getting on getting better um, which again is quite a euphemistic way of speaking isn't it it's putting on the pretense that everything is okay when it's not and this uh, this idea links again to uh, this this line sorry links again to the idea of performance and the idea that it's a formula um, also kind of almost connotes the idea of rehearsing. Uh, the fact that she's she's gone through it so many times that it's become a formula. Um, so all of this, again, links to the idea of acting and performance. At home, thinking ahead. Bed, a good idea. Bed solves a lot. Answer the phone. Be wary what to say to it. But grateful always. Contrive meals for a hunger striker. Track down whimsical, soft-centred, happy all the way through novels. Find the cat, mysteriously reassuring. Cancel things, tidy things, pretend all's well. Admit it's not. Now again, we see this quite frantic listing, don't we, of activity. Um, the novels that the narrator seems to, the speaker seems to be uh, tracking down are happy making her feel a lot happier, but they lack meaning and are quite whimsical, um, which is perhaps sometimes what you would want in, in the face of illness. You wouldn't want something with too uh, deep a theme or, or resonance. Um, there is also here, we see, um, two uses of parenthesis. Um, bed solves a lot. Uh, and the cat, we are told, is mysteriously reassuring. They're not sure why, but the cat makes the person who's ill... Uh, feel a lot better. Now, this use of parenthesis almost creates a kind of double layer of internal dialogue, which just shows the kind of level of uh, of, of thinking and the, the monotony of, 
uh, of, of these activities. Now, I said at the start that there was a kind of an interpretation that the speaker of the of the poem is the person who's ill, and also there's a there's the view that the speaker of uh, the poem is the partner of someone who's ill. Now, there is this line here, contrive meals for a hunger striker. Now, this could be the speaker referring uh, to themselves, as in they're not feeling, uh, they don't have much of an appetite, so they're having to kind of contrive these meals together uh, because they're not eating. Or it could be the partner who's, you know, uh, having to kind of put together these meals and are worried about how they're going to get um, their ill partner to, to eat. Now, this line at the end of this stanza is particularly significant. As it says here, the speaker is seemingly trying to keep their emotions intact in face of illness. And we've got this, uh, like I said at the start, this listing of imperative verbs, which I suppose do, does create uh, an impression of order, which is sharply juxtaposed to the, to the free verse form of the poem and 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 really this this final two lines of this stanza so it says cancel things tidy things again activity activity and then we get this pretend all's well admit it's not now this is really quite significant because these lines highlight this tension that i spoke about between truth and evasion and we see that the social pretense here is faltering it's starting to shatter uh, the line break here that Fanthorpe employs is really significant. Pretend all's well, break, admit it's not. Our attention is drawn to that final line of the stanza. Learn to conjugate all the genres of misery, tears, torpor, boredom, lassitude, yearnings for a simpler illness like a broken leg. Now this is uh, quite fitting here. We get even more asyndetic listing of the various aspects of, of misery. We've got tears, torpor, boredom. Uh, yeah, and, and some of these you may not even know, but they're all different kind of genres, uh, all different um, synonyms, really, for lethargy. Uh, so lassitude uh, is the state of physical or mental weariness, lack of energy. Torpor is uh, a state of mental inactivity and lethargy. And this, I mean, this uh, f this final line on, on this slide, yearning for a simpler illness like a broken leg. Presumably the speaker there is wishing for something that at least people can see. It's something that's visible. Um, and also a broken leg, possibly unlike the illness that uh, that the speaker is suffering with, is something that can be cured and something that can be fixed easily. One last thing um, I would also say um, about this section of the poem is notice these lines about answering the phone but be wary what to say to it. Now this has a chimes quite closely with um, what we saw in a previous stanza about uh, having formulas for well-meant intrusiveness. So the speaker is almost having to tell herself not to say too much over the phone to people and not to reveal too much to keep this this fabrication alive to keep this the to keep the pretenses um, alive. So moving on, enduring ceremonial delays, being referred somewhere else, consultant's holiday, saying thank you for anything to everyone. Now this line about ceremonial delays in the hospital, um, I suppose it, it infers that there is a uh, a level of formality to what the she is going through. Uh, the fact that several high-ranking people have to check the the dosages, check um, check the appointments and things, because uh, obviously this is making its way all the way up to the consultants in the hospital. Um, but also, I get the impression that the ceremonial delays implies also that these delays are quite regular and that they do happen quite a lot. Um, and the speaker also pokes fun at being referred to different apartments and consultants always having holidays and things like that. We also um, get this line about saying thank you for anything to everyone. Now this shows really the banality and emptiness of language in the face of illness, just kind of churning out thank yous and 
I'll be okays and all of that stuff. And this further highlights the speaker's lack of control over their illness, that they're now just left saying thank you for anything to everyone. Um, and really what we see here is that their, their power of language uh, deteriorate and also their 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 control over their situation deteriorate. So really, yeah, this is focusing again on the idea of uh, emptiness of language and the banality of language. Uh, and, and this chimes in quite closely to what we spoke about with the use of euphemisms earlier. Not the star part, and who would want it? I jettison the spear, the servant's tray, the terrible drone of chorus. Yet to my thinking, this act was ill-advised. It would have been better to die. No, it wouldn't. I'm here to make you believe in life. Now, what we see here as a, is is a quite strong, uh, impassioned ending, reaffirming the sort of value in life and the value of the fight. Um, again, we link back straight back to the idea of uh, the conceit of acting. So it kind of picks up where the where the poem first starts. And says that they don't want the star part. That they, they th who would want a star part? Who would want to be the main character? Um, now, one interpretation, again, is if you are reading this poem as it being the speaker's partner who's ill, it might be them who has the... Uh, it might be them who has the star part, and the speaker's partner is forced to play a minor role in their story, their, their journey of illness, so to speak. Um, this word jettison just means to throw and drop. So the speaker is throwing away uh, their, the, the kind of trappings of their minor role, so to speak, and tr throws away the spear, throws away the servant's tray. The terrible drone of chorus, yet to my thinking this act was ill-advised, it would have been better to die. Now here we get a, uh, a bit of intertextuality that I will speak about in a second. Um, I'll speak about that, those lines in italics. Um, but what we see here towards the end of the poem is a very strong personal voice, and this is emphasised through this exclamative, short exclamative sentence, and this quite emphatically positioned final single line stanza which sees the social pretense eventually just dropped altogether. We saw uh, cracks in it earlier on in the poem, but now it's completely dropped, and the speaker of the poem appears to affirm the value of life. Now, again, I will leave this to you to think about, whether you think that this is the, the, the speaker who is ill, who is speaking to us, telling us that I'm here to make you believe in life, or whether this is the, the, the partner of someone who is ill, who is almost speaking to, the, to, the, to their partner who is ill, um, that they are there to make them believe in life and to be this, this rock, this constant for them. So there are two ways of reading that when it comes down to the, to the voice of the poem. Undoubtedly, what we see here is a, a sort of shift and a positive shift and, a, and, a, and an affirmation of the value of life. And I would focus also here on that, that exclamative, no it wouldn't, this impassioned response. Now, these lines from Oedipus Rex, um, yet to my thinking this act was ill-advised, it would have been better to die. So what Fanthorpe actually uses in this poem is a quotation from uh, Oedipus Rex, a classical Greek tragedy by Sophocles. Now, um, Oedipus, in the story, as it says here, discovers that a man he killed when he was younger was his father. He also finds out that his wife, Jocasta, is also his mother. Jocasta eventually kills herself, and in his despair over his actions, Oedipus blinds himself. After he does so, the chorus, who we probably know uh, in plays are a group on stage who comment on the action, or sometimes, as we would know now, join in with the, with the main songs in musicals, etc. They say it would have been better for Oedipus to die rather than to continue to suffer. This reference to Oedipus Rex therefore adds to the theatrical conceit as well as to the ideas about suffering which run through a minor role. So we could describe these lines as a classical uh, allusion, a classical reference, uh, and also an element of intertextuality here that all support this idea uh, of acting and performance. 
But remember, I mean, <laughs> Oedipus Rex is a pretty messed up story, but remember, the speaker of this poem strongly refutes that. Okay, No, it wouldn't have been better to die. Uh, and there is a, a real kind of shift and uh, a focus on the, the value of life. Now, just to wrap up a few thoughts on this poem, um, I'm going to read a section of the Edexcel poem commentary that I think uh, articulates some of what I've said very well. I would encourage you to look on the Edexcel website because there is a PDF available uh, with short commentaries uh, for each poem. They don't go into masses of detail, uh, but they are quite succinct and, uh, and concise and, like I said, articulate their points very well. So it says, um, at the core of this moving poem is a concern about how we speak truthfully in the face of life's most difficult moments. The metaphor of the stage and the narrator's minor role within a play is used to explore ideas of social pretense. In the face of serious illness, the narrator carries on acting. So remember the, well, uh, the formula for well-meant intrusiveness, getting on, getting better. This all links back to the idea of performing, putting on a role and, uh, and putting on social pretenses. Um, also links to the idea of euphemisms and the way in which we often um, use euphemistic language to hide the reality of a situation. Fanthorpe establishes a dual perspective. Not only is the narrator an actor, but she is also a member of the audience, watching as the action unfolds. Observed is a key word in the first line implying distance and a sense of perspective, a stance the narrator retains up until the last line. So we mentioned, didn't we, that there were cracks in the pretense earlier uh, earlier in the poem when on the line, uh, pretend all's well, admit it's not. And by the last line, the pretense is eventually fully dropped. Now this is, uh, the next point refers to what I was speaking about, about the voice of the poem and who is, where is this voice coming from? There is evidence to suggest the narrator is caring for a patient and therefore being unacknowledged and playing a minor role, fitting with the title, obviously. Though some might suggest that it is the speaker herself who is the passive observer of her own illness. So, this is basically the debate about which perspective is this, is this poetical voice coming from. The poem explores a wider refusal in society to look dying and death in the eye. These concerns are enacted through Fanthorpe's use of direct speech in the poem, alongside references to socially appropriate forms of language. So yes, we do mention, uh, we, we, we do see, sorry, uh, a lot of direct speech in italics. And remember what I said about almost creating a, a second layer and almost an in, a double internal monologue, so to speak. For much of the poem, the narrator and the people around her deal in euphemism and false cheerfulness. While these conventional exchanges help to keep the monstrous fabric of, day, uh, of daily life intact, they fail to communicate the patient's predicament truthfully. And we do see this, don't we? This pretense ultimately being failing to really convey her true predicament. Remember that the, the narrator almost jokes that they are now left just saying thank you to, for anything to everyone. And we see this almost emptiness and powerlessness of language. So I hope you've enjoyed some of these thoughts on this poem uh, and let me know what you think of it.